2 Timothy chapter 3. It is going to be a few minutes before we're at 2 Timothy chapter 3, but that's our first passage we'll be at together in just a few minutes. So if you've got your Bible with you and have it open to 2 Timothy chapter 3, we'll be ready to go. Maybe have some folks who might still be working their way here. Hopefully we'll see a few more people gather in. Glad to see some folks who haven't been feeling well coming back. I don't know if any of that crust has been going around. I don't know if any of the babies are still finishing out with all their stuff too. We are continuing a study we started a few weeks ago of a brief overview of doctrines from different denominations in Christianity and world religions. Uh, we just kind of laid some basics down and a few weeks ago in our first class about what is the church and the work of the church and what the New Testament teaches about the church and wanting to be honest about the fact that that's what our authority is and that's the authority we want to follow. And from there, looking into some other beliefs and thoughts and doctrines that we see being taught about among other groups that wear the name of Christian, as well as starting in next week, we'll get some various worldviews as well. We'll start talking about Buddhism and Hinduism and Islam, Mormonism, some of these things in a couple of the weeks to come on our Wednesday night class. Uh, just a reminder of what we're hoping to accomplish with these particular lessons on Wednesday night, the fact that we're looking to reinforce the Bible's teachings of the New Testament and teachings of Christianity that we find there in the New Testament. We're not looking to just say, what's my opinion or what's your opinion or what's the Judson Road you know, thoughts for 2024. We're looking to reinforce this is what God's Word teaches about how we worship Him, how we become Christians, how we live as Christians. We want to be focused then on that. We want to become familiar second, secondarily uh, with the basic and common doctrines from other religions and from Christian denominations and how they might clash with the teaching of the New Testament and looking to provide clarity what the New Testament teaches us to do. That's a lot of the in-class stuff we're doing on Wednesday evening is talking about some different views, talking about where some of these different denominations or world religions originate from, talking about some of those things and talking to par parallel to the Bible, seeing do those things line up or do they not line up. And then thirdly is a goal that we'll be using in class and particularly, especially out of class, I can encourage you to keep doing this, praying for two things. Number one, for opportunities to discuss these types of things about what the New Testament teaches, especially as we maybe have varying views with our friends and our family and our neighbors and our co-workers and other people we know in our lives. And secondly, as we pray for those opportunities and as those prayers are answered with opportunities for those conversations, that we're prepared with knowledge and wisdom, with graciousness and boldness and all those type of things we need in our words and our attitude as we enter into those conversations. Uh, as we are then doing this particular class, some things to remind ourselves of. The New Testament is going to be our standard of authority. We're going to always be looking to talk about what the Scriptures talk about and what they say. Uh, 2 Timothy 3.16, which I've asked you to open up to, will be probably a very familiar passage throughout these classes together. Uh, but that's a great reminder of the fact that we start with the inspired Word of God, and that's what is our authority for what we do and what we teach. Uh, secondly, the ugly talk, name-calling, degrading speech is not going to be tolerated. This is not our evening tonight to bash on a particular denomination of people that we know, to talk about, oh, how could those people possibly think in this, or how could they ever believe that? Our goal is not to bring people down or to tear people down. Our goal is to say, here's what false teaching is, and to go after that with the power of God's Word, rather than going after the individual people themselves as we go in this class, and then helping, hopefully, reach those people. Thirdly, a reminder that this is not your time to get on your soapbox and gripe about your cousin, your coworker. I keep picking a different C occupation. I had car guy, I have chiropractor, whoever you know in your life that might fit into this scenario or this denomination and think, oh, I have this neighbor and he's just so obnoxious and he's always blah, blah. This is not the class for this. This is not the time for that. 8012 or 812 tonight on the parking lot. Uh, I really encourage you not to do that then either, but that can be a time you maybe think about that. We talked about the Roman Catholic Church last week. We're continuing this evening by thinking about the Baptist Church and the things we find in the Baptist Church. Again, like I said last week, I'm constantly praying for myself through these classes that I'm being humble, that I'm being honest, that as I'm approaching these classes, that I'm doing my best to represent what we might know our Baptist friends and neighbors and family to teach and look to go to sources from things they would be saying about that. Uh, and as I do so, to try to give them the best case to present those arguments and also making sure that I'm not looking to misrepresent or hurt or attack family or friends or even people here as well. But we're looking to, again, just compare these things to the truth 
of Scripture. But before we get into our class and get into thinking about that tonight, I want to humble our hearts and spend some time in prayer. Glenn, if you would lead us in a word of prayer as we get started. Thank you, brother. Amen. All right. Our objectives tonight, uh, similar objectives to what we've had last week with the Roman Catholic Church, looking to summarize the origins and history of the Baptist Church, to secondly list some core aspects of Baptist doctrine, uh, and then thirdly show how this conflicts with the teachings of the New Testament. And hopefully you'll notice as we go through these classes, uh, if you didn't pick on it last week, you'll maybe pick up on it tonight, and times that we have text in blue come up on the screen. Those are pointing us to our New Testament passages related to uh, this is where we want to be grounded and maybe some things that are going to be put up against what we're finding from being talked from various doctrines and other places. Uh, so as we begin tonight, uh, just a, a very quick overview of some origins and history of the Baptist Church. John Smith in London is rebaptized or ba- rebaptizes himself in 607 or 1607. Uh, there's some question, I guess, even already, and just a couple of the sources I have and looking up that, there are some people who think that somebody else rebaptized him, but it seems he was uncomfortable with his infant baptism he experienced in an earlier point in life. So he was rebaptized, and around that time, the General Baptist Church is recognized there in England. A couple years later, around 1633, the particular Baptist Church emerges. So you have these two groups early on, the General Baptist and the particular Baptist. And some of the two main dividing differences between them is how they think about atonement. The general Baptists hold a more general view of atonement, and the particular Baptists hold a more limited view of atonement. Uh, maybe more Calvinistic view, we'll talk about that a bit more in a moment, but maybe that only certain people have been appointed by God to be saved, that the sacrifice of Jesus is only for those who have been predestined to be those who would uh, follow God and would respond to the call of the Spirit to become children of God and to be the lights into the world then. In that regard, there's as well as some differences in who could partake in communion. We'll talk about communion a little bit and some thoughts about communion uh, from what I understand the Baptist Church uh, towards the end of our class tonight. In America, Roger Williams and Ezekiel Holman organized the first Baptist Church in Providence, Rhode Island in 1639. So we've had Baptist churches here in our country for a long time. Uh, But even as we think about that, recognizing When we look at dates like 1607, 1639, compare that to what we talk about as where do we go to our inspiration for the church beginning and the church pattern we're looking to follow is not something that started 400 years ago, but something that goes all the way back to the first century, to the day of Pentecost and Acts chapter 2, and looking to see that's uh, where our source of our teaching is. A few other things about origin and history. Uh, maybe more a bit about the breakup or the, uh, the breakdown of the Baptist Church. There are some 50 plus denominations of the Baptist Church in the United States. Uh, along with that, there's a lot of independent Baptist Church. So you might see the name Baptist, and just seeing the name Baptist on a church could mean a whole variety of different things. About 90% of Baptists in America would belong to one of those main five groups the Southern Baptist Convention, which especially down here in the Bible Belt, we're probably familiar with that group or familiar with that phrase. There are about 16 million members in America with that particular denomination of the Baptist Church. The National Baptist Convention, the National Baptist Convention of America, Baptist, American Baptist Convention USA, or Churches USA, and the Baptist Bible Fellowship International. Uh, you know, about 15.3% of Americans identify as Baptist. This isn't, you know, you're all for, get, get gold stars for just being here for your presence tonight. But does anybody remember how much of the U.S. population is Roman Catholic from last week? About how much? 20, wasn't it? It was about 20, 22, if I remember correctly. So this is what I've seen in other sources. The second largest denomination of Christianity within America would be uh, the Baptist Church. I want to especially point out this particular slide to help us understand and recognize even similar to what we would think about our Catholic friends and neighbors and family, and I even had a chance to talk with uh, Patrick Marshall last week about this and him coming from a Catholic background, is understanding that just because someone identifies as a Baptist or as a Catholic 
doesn't mean that they're automatically prescribed or fit into this mold of everything we're talking about, or they're automatically agreeing with everything. There are plenty of people who identify or check the box as being a Catholic or a Baptist or whatever type of religion or a Christian, and that's just how they were raised, or they continue to do that, even though they may not be practicing things. There are a whole bunch of variety, even amongst the Baptist denomination, about what they believe about how they do certain things, or how people live as Christians, or how people become Christians. I'm doing my best in these particular classes to give the broadest overview as we have conversations with people. We know maybe at least some starting points or some things uh, as those conversations particularly relate to how we become as Christians, uh, how we live as Christians and stay Christians uh, might come up in conversations. That might be some of the strongest clashing points. Let's get into doctrine, though. That's really what we want to focus on and think about. Uh, A couple of quotes to begin this evening. All evangelical churches profess to take the Holy Scriptures as their own and sufficient guide in matters of religious faith and practice. Baptists especially claim to have no authoritative creed except the New Testament. That comes from a Baptist publication. That first sentence sounds really good, that the Scriptures are the highest and most supreme authority in what we do and how we listen and know things about God. That goes on to say, though, in the next sentence, It's common, however, for churches to have formulated statements on what are understood to be the leading Christian doctrines printed and circulated among their members. In fact, some of you might have these or might know some of these, these different manuals. Uh, The standard manual for the Baptist church is the SMBC uh, that's quoted up there from page 56. And most of our quotations this evening are going to come from here tonight. You have the standard Baptist manual or the Baptist church manual. You have the Philadelphia Confessions and New Hampshire Confessions of Faith, these different publications that say these are what we believe as Baptists. To remind ourselves just a second about some of those things, about creeds, about confessions, if you remember our class we did on authority uh, from that book, Mind Your King by Joy Moyer, we had an essay, I think it was essay 10 in that book, talked about how uh, creeds and the authority of human creeds and what we should do or how we should think about these types of things. These seven things I'm not going to go over in detail right here, but just a reminder about how a creed might or how a creed does go beyond the teaching of Scripture. I'm just reminding ourselves that creeds or manuals or confessions that are made and published and circulated by men, first of all, are not compromised simply of articles of truth, but is given for the purpose of safeguarding a fellowship of something greater than any local church. The idea that multiple local churches are going to submit to this other publication to say, we agree with this teaching and this thing, and if you don't, then you're outside of our fellowship in that regard. There's the creed as superimposed on Scripture. The creed assumes a position of authority that is unwarranted. Say, do you accept this creed? Do you follow the teachings of this manual or not? Uh, third or Fourthly, a creed is an instrument of division, not unity. There's fifth, a historical tendency was to continue elaboration. Number six, a creed is often the result of overreacting and overreaching. And seventh, the nature of a creed is that it stifles Bible study. Some of those things are more of their dangers or there's warnings against creed rather than just straight hindrances or these are things that are absolutely always happening. But the things we need to be aware of as we hear about people who accept creeds or confessions or manuals and go to those things for a source of scripture and teaching. For the, for the credit, if I can call it that or say that, when you open up the standard Baptist manual or the standard manual for Baptist churches and they give their various uh, rules or they give the various understandings and teachings of Scripture and doctrine, they're often full of Scripture associated with that as well. But I think we see some of these points up here about imposing fellowship lines, often going a th- a beyond Scripture, giving a voice or a sense of authority to something other than Scripture itself. I got a quotation from Brother Moyer as he talked about this in that particular section or that essay of Mind Your King. The issue with the creed is that it oversteps the line of teaching and moves into that realm of authoritative boundary marking for a group of believers that is larger than a local congregation. The idea that we would agree with teaching, I mean, having a class on Bible authority is me teaching and talking about Bible authority and us agreeing with what Bible authority is and how we establish Bible authority and follow along, or what is the church is us talking about that. When we start putting creeds into that, we would start expecting to say, brethren in other places need to adopt that too. We're getting outside of what the pattern of Scripture teaches and talks about. So that's some of those as we hear uh, quotations or we hear allusions or references and authority to different confessions or different manuals 
Those are why we need to be cautious about accepting those things or seeing those things and giving them authority that they don't have. Uh, I know that's just kind of talking about a little bit of history and a little bit of establishing where doctrine comes from. Uh, Again, to the credit, they do talk about the importance of Scripture, and they do look at a lot of Scripture and talk a lot about Scripture. And so uh, very different from the Catholic Church that elevates traditions of teachings of the church itself and even saying that the church is the only place that gets to interpret Scripture Uh, different Protestant groups like Baptists will go to Scripture for their source of authority. Uh, But before I go on, comments or questions, things, insights to provide before we get any farther, and a couple of specifics related to some doctrines that are talked talked about. Okay. That's what I figured uh, uh, for now. So let's get into looking at some doctrines that uh, are taught. Again, these quotations coming from one of the manuals from the Baptist church and some ways that they believe certain things. I guess before I do that, I should go back to my slide before and make the point of why I had you open up to 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16 and verse 17. Again, probably a passage that's familiar to us. and recognizing and seeing that people do look to the Holy Scriptures as a sufficient guide for authority uh, and how there might be other things that are brought in, statements of faith or confessions or manuals, remind ourselves of what it says about Scripture in 2 Timothy 3, verse 16 and 17, that all Scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness. The man of God may be complete and equipped for every good work. That if we want to teach somebody how to be as a Christian, how to live as a Christian, how to have fellowship with that person, that we will teach them. And the idea is that we will talk about God's Word, but God's Word needs to be the authority, needs to be the place that we go back to, and that needs to be the standard by which we follow and live. And being careful about trying to say, let's put it this way, and we'll all agree to this one particular saying, or we'll listen to what Tracy has to say, kind of elevate his statements above everything else, kind of what we believe. It's very close to Scripture. I hope I'm, I'm being clear about that and why we recognize that Scripture alone is what we need to establish that source of authority and for the doctrines in that regard. So let's get now into some specific doctrines. Um, this quote I had up a second ago. Thinking about uh, why we need salvation or just kind of the, the situation that man finds themselves in, we begin by this quotation that says, All mankind, being by nature utterly void of that holiness required by the law of God and positively inclined to evil. Uh, Baptists generally will rely on some mysterious working of the Holy Spirit to, quote, give a holy disposition to the mind, end quote, and to enable the sinner to give you, or to give, quote, a voluntary obedience to the gospel, end quote. You're going to find some, some very similar ideas to teachings of Calvinism, where it's specifically called that. Maybe sometimes it's used other terms. Maybe rather than being hardcore Calvinistic, it's maybe just I'm a little bit Calvinistic in my teaching and my ideas. So among Baptists, there are varying degrees of acceptance of Calvinistic teachings. Maybe you've heard of the TULIP acronym. You've heard of some of that maybe before about Calvinism, the idea of total depravity, which is what we're kind of talking about here, that just by being born in this world, I'm a depraved human because Adam sinned, kind of this inheritance of original sin. In fact, in some ways, when Calvinism is talked about, it's not just total depravity, but total inherited depravity. That because I come to the world, the sins of my father and my grandfather and rest of mankind is brought upon me too, and that I am then in need of something in order to, to be saved. Other parts of Calvinism that are talked about would be unconditional election, the idea that I don't choose that I'm chosen to be a Christian. There's that limited atonement we kind of talked about earlier for some Baptists believe and talked about even early on uh, that only some people were selected to be saved. There's this idea of irresistible grace, that if the Holy Spirit calls you to be a Christian, there's nothing you could do to kick against that, that you will become a Christian. And then fifthly, the perseverance of the saints, this idea of once saved, always saved, that we'll see a little bit later as well. You know, I want to do my best. I hope that's a fair representation of what those doctrines believe and talk about. And I'm sure there's even more to go into each of those in depth and to see what those things say. And again, is that truly in line with Scripture? Is that close to Scripture but twisting Scripture? That would be a valuable study on our own to, to do outside of this particular class. But to see this, this first idea that all mankind being by nature utterly void of that holiness. 
We recognize that we are not condemned for the sins of others. I want you to open your Old Testaments to Ezekiel chapter 18. Uh, Ezekiel chapter 18. I may not read all of 1 through 24 right now, but I want to encourage you to note all of 1 through 24. We're probably familiar with Ezekiel 18, 4. Uh, Behold, all souls are mine, the soul of the Father as well as the soul of the Son is mine. The soul who sins shall die. That point is made, and that point is continued to be elaborated on by the prophet here through the rest of the chapter, or at least through these next few verses, through verse 24. We're probably familiar with verse 19 and verse 20 as well. You say, what should, or why should not the Son suffer for the iniquity of the Father? When the Son has done what is just and right and has been careful to observe all my statutes, he shall surely live. The soul who sins shall die. The Son shall not suffer for the iniquity of the Father, nor the Father suffer for the iniquity of the Son. The righteousness of the righteous shall be upon himself, and the wickedness of the wicked shall be upon himself. There are times in Scripture it talks about the idea of punishments to generations to the third and the fourth. I think what we're seeing in that is there is a, a habit that's picked up among people that as people grow up, they pick up the habits of their fathers or they pick up the, fa- the habits of the community, but not themselves just because they're born in that community being sinful from the moment they exit the womb in that regard. We can get a little bit more of Ezekiel 18 if we have some time to do so. I want to see how this thought is really talked about throughout the chapter, or at least throughout these first 24 verses. So let's begin in verse 1 of Ezekiel chapter 18. The word of the Lord came to me. What do you mean by repeating this proverb concerning the land of Israel? The fathers have eaten sour grapes, and the children's teeth are set on edge. Pause there in verse 2. What does that mean, that proverb? All right, we've got an, an honest I don't know. That's good. All right, Tracy, you have some sour milk, and you take a swig of that, and then a few minutes later, Barrett goes, right, the idea that somebody has experienced something and that's consequences of that are put onto the next generation. I thought that Tracy drinks some sour milk or eats something sour, and then Barrett starts puckering because it's so sour in that regard. There's this thought that, you know, maybe Israel is crying out saying, it's our father's fault that we're in the situation we're in, that you're angry with us. So pick up in verse 3, Ezekiel 18. As I live, declares the Lord God, this proverb shall no more be used by you in Israel. Behold, all souls are mine. The souls of the Father as well as the soul of the Son is mine. And the soul who sins shall die. If a man is righteous and does what is just and right, if he does not eat upon the mountains or lift up his eyes to idols to the house of Israel, does not defile his neighbor's wife or approach a woman in her time of menstrual impurity, does not oppress anyone, but restores the debtor his pledge, commits no robbery, gives his bread to the hungry, and covers the naked with a garment, does not lend at an interest or take any profit, withholds his hand from injustice, executes true justice between man and a man, walks in my statutes, and keeps my rules by acting faithfully. If a man does those things, he is righteous, and he shall surely live, declares the Lord God. If he fathers a son who is violent, A shedder of blood who does all any of these things, though he himself did none of these things, who even eats up the mountains, defiles his neighbor's wife, opposes the poor and needy, oppresses them, uh, commits robbery, does not restore the pledge, lifts up his eyes to idols, commits abomination, lends at an interest, and takes profit. Shall he live then? So the father is righteous. Here's the son who does all these wicked and terrible things. Shall he live? He shall not live, verse 13 says. He has done all these abominations. He shall surely die. His blood shall be upon himself. Now suppose this man fathers a son who sees all the sins that his father had done. He sees and does not do likewise. He does not even eat upon the mountain or lift up his eyes. Uh, He withholds his hand from iniquity, verse 17 says. Verse 18, as for his father, because he practiced exhortation or exhortion, robbed his brother and did what was not good among his people. Behold, he shall die for his iniquity. So here you have a grandfather who's righteous, a son who, or, who, or the next generation who is not as righteous, who is wicked, and then the person after that who does not do what his father did. And God says, each of those people I'll deal with according to how they live, that we do not find ourselves being judged or finding ourselves inheriting sins or being punished for the sins of those before us. 
As well as Scripture speaking to the point that the Holy Spirit does not work in this particular miraculous way of it needs to give us some type of mind or understanding it needs to work in our lives in order to then receive the gospel, be ready to receive the gospel. We get Romans chapter 10, verse 17. Uh, as you're turning to Romans 10, 17, I imagine somebody can quote it for us as we're getting our eyes on to. Romans 10, 17, faith and hearing by the word of God or the word of Christ talked about in there. That faith, as it's talked about in Scripture, comes through as we hear about that faith and the message of God and we learn about God and the Word of God and the Word of Christ. Ephesians chapter 3, verse 3 and verse 5. Ephesians 3, verse 3 through verse 5. Paul says in Ephesians 3 and verse 3, How the mystery was made known to me by revelation, as I have written, to you, or as I have written briefly. When you read this, you can perceive my insight into the mystery of Christ, which was not made known to the sons of men of other generations, and has now been revealed to his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit. These prophets and these New Testament apostles have been revealed the mystery of the fact that Gentiles are part of the plan of salvation, that the God's plan of salvation is for all people. People hear that and know that, but it is the Spirit who's inspired these men to tell other people to hear their words then. And as we see this, uh, it goes to the point of, we don't see in Scripture, at least I'm not aware of any place in Scripture, that we're finding the Spirit has to be involved in my life before I'm ready to receive the words of the apostles and the New Testament prophets. Before I can hear the words of faith, that the Spirit has to move in my life to prepare me specifically for that. Does that mean through God's providence or through the Spirit that there are people who are put in my life who've taught me the gospel? Surely, absolutely there could be that. That somebody invites me to worship, that I grow up in a home, that people love the Lord and teach me about Him. could be, but that's different than saying I believe that the Spirit is working miraculously in individual people's lives, some so and some not, in order to prepare them to receive the gospel. That goes to the next point or this next part of teaching that we want to look at, that salvation is holy of grace. Justification is dependent on believing in Christ and is, quote, solely through faith in Christ, end quote. A point goes on to say that sinners are justified when their faith causes the righteousness of Christ to be imputed or counted to them by God. Some passages that are going to go with that, some passages that you can find even listed with that, and some of the manuals would be places like Romans chapter 4 and Romans chapter 5. We're going to go somewhere else before we get there, but we will come back to those texts in a moment. Uh, it goes on to say that Baptists, quote, believe the scriptures teach that repentance and faith are sacred duties and also irreparable. Um, let me find my text down here so I can see a little bit better. Also, irreparable graces wrought in the soul by the regenerating spirit of God. They do that we believe and that we will repent and that we will have faith, but it's because of God and because of his grace and because we put our faith in God that we're saved. Uh, I don't think specific to Baptists, but maybe you've heard the phrase, uh, by grace alone, by faith alone, in Christ alone, through Scripture alone, and there's another alone, then some of that as well, kind of coming from some Reformed theology around the time of Martin Luther, kind of differentiating from the ways of the Catholic Church that talked about you need to have the church and you need to have the teachings of the church and the traditions of the church along with Scripture in order to live as a Christian. Some thoughts from kicking against some of that. Obviously, the point we're making tonight is not that grace and faith are not a part of salvation. If that's the part where we go, we swing the pendulum too far that direction, we're also misrepresenting Scripture and misteaching the gospel. Absolutely, God's grace is the foundation of everything, of the plan of salvation, and we need to respond in faith. But to say that we are holy of grace and that it is solely through faith in Christ leaves a misrepresentation of what the plan of salvation taught in the gospel is. And that idea of repentance and faith are things that are, we must do in order to be Christians. Uh, some thoughts with this, that faith alone does not save. Maybe as we think about hearing that idea that faith alone is what we need to have, or the idea that we're saved by faith alone. Uh, we're taken to James chapter 2, verse 21 through verse 24. James chapter 2, verse 21 through verse 24. Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he offered up his son Isaac on the altar? You see that faith was active along with his works, and faith was completed by his works. And the scripture was fulfilled that said, Abraham believed God, and it was counted to him as righteousness. That's part of the idea in here that uh, maybe we have our righteousness that's counted to us from somebody else. 
The scriptures do say in Genesis 15 that Abraham's, because of Abraham's faith, it was counted to him as righteousness, and he called it, was called a friend of God. Verse 24, you see a person is justified by works and not by faith alone. The point is not to go too far the other direction as well from the it's not by faith alone to say we have to do things in order to be saved. The point is that we respond to the gospel with an active faith, not just a passive faith. And we would be Christians then. To say that I just mentally believe and at some point I am then a Christian and, a, and a, someone who is a, uh, a child of God is not what the gospel teaches. And again, as you talk with some of your Baptist friends and family, they might agree with you to that point. They might say, of course, you can't just have a one moment of faith in that spot and say, oh, then you're just a Christian forever. There are some things you'll have to run into then, and you might run into then that they teach and talk about that might kind of say, well, how do you justify that type of teaching with what we find in Scripture? The point that we see, that second bullet point up there, sinners are justified when their faith causes righteousness, the righteousness of Christ to be imputed to them by God. The thought, as I've seen it described in multiple places and heard it from other people as well, is that we are people who are guilty of sin. We're guilty of sin from the moment we come to the world. But when the Spirit prepares us to receive Jesus, that we put our faith in Jesus, and it is Jesus who then covers us. And He is one who covers us. And so God does not see our sins, but He just sees the righteousness and the goodness and the faithfulness of Jesus. And it is just Jesus' righteousness that God sees rather than us and our sinful selves. But as we see in scriptures, in places like Romans chapter 3, as we, even as we see in Romans chapter 4 and Romans chapter 5, let's get Romans chapter 4. Um, Romans chapter 4, verse 20. We'll start there in a second. The question comes up to think about, are we righteous or have we been declared righteous by God? Are we justified or are we just sinners who are covered by Jesus' righteousness? The, the teaching that comes from this thought is that if it's just Jesus' righteousness that covers us, then I am not truly forgiven of sins. It's just Jesus who's covering over me that I'm not finding God's wrath. And those sound like similar things, but it's different from what Scripture talks about of us receiving forgiveness of sins. Or God saying that I am justified. Not saying that I am perfect and I'll never do anything wrong again, but God says that someone is justified when they put their faith in Him. Romans 4, verse 20 through verse 24, No unbelief made him waver concerning the promise of God, it's talking about Abraham, but he grew strong in his faith as he gave glory to God, fully convinced that God was able to do what he had promised. This is why his faith was counted to him as righteousness, but the words that was counted to him were not written for his sake alone, but for ours also. It will be counted to us who believe in him, who raised him from the dead, Jesus our Lord." Go ahead and finish the chapter, who was delivered up for our trespasses and raised for our justification. What we're seeing there is that uh, we are declared righteous, that we are counted as righteous, but it is not just that Christ's righteousness is transferred onto us, but the idea that but our faith in Jesus and God declares us righteous, declares us justified, declares us forgiveness of our sins, and then we walk in a way that has faith that's active like the faith of Abraham. Again, going on and similar to that, within that kind of line of logic and thought, leads to this point of being truly regenerated or being born of the Spirit, that we will not utterly fall away and perish, but will endure to the end. This is that idea of once saved, always saved. That if I become a Christian, if I put my faith in Christ, that the Holy Spirit has called me, then I, there's nothing that I can do to be separated from God then. There's obviously many places in Scripture that speak to that. You think about Acts chapter 8 from some of our recent reading with Simon the sorcerer. In Acts chapter 8, verse 12 and verse 13, Simon believed Philip's preaching, and Simon himself is baptized. But you get the latter portion of that in Acts chapter 8. Notice with me when Peter responds to Simon after he asked to receive this gift of the Spirit, after trying to pay for it with silver. In Acts chapter 8, verse 22, Repent, therefore, of this wickedness of yours, and pray to the Lord, if possible, the intent of your heart may be forgiven you. For I see you are in the goal of bitterness and in the bond of iniquity. That does not sound like somebody who's in a good relationship with God, but someone who needs forgiveness, someone who needs change in their life, someone who is a believer, someone who was a disciple of, of Christ. And Simon responds appropriately and says in verse 24, Pray for me to the Lord, that nothing what you have said may come upon me. We don't have 
any more about Simon in that regard, but I, what I understand what I believe is that that means that he is somebody who repented and changed his mind and changed his heart and recognized that he should not look for this gift the way like he is looking for his pride and for his attention, but like he needs to change his thinking and put that pride aside. Uh, let's move to Hebrews chapter 3. Maybe you see Galatians chapter uh, 5 verse 4, this idea of falling away from grace talked about there if we try to justify ourselves by the works of the law. Hebrews chapter 3 and verse 12. We'll get this uh, to continue to make this point. Hebrews chapter 3 verse 12. Take care, brothers, lest there be in any of you an evil and unbelieving heart leading you to fall away from the living God. The Hebrew writer is using an example about what happened in the wilderness, quoting from a psalm that talks about the history before that, and going to say, here are people who were God's people but fell away because they lacked faith and trusting in God. And there's the thought and the danger that if the Hebrew Christians don't have faith in Jesus and trust in Jesus through the persecutions and suffering they're going and leave Jesus behind and go after something else, that they'll find themselves falling away from God as well. I want to make sure we make the point that God does give us assurance of salvation. God does give us that hope to say that we are people who follow him. We look forward to that reward. That should never be something that's, I'm unsure, I'm unstable, I don't really know. If I'm a Christian who's following Jesus and serving him, that I should have confidence in that blessed assurance we're going to sing about in a little bit once we get to our songs. From 1 John chapter 5 and verse 13, I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God that you may know that you have eternal life. And earlier in the chapter, he talks about this idea of what does it mean to be someone who believes in Jesus? That means that we believe in him, that we love him, that we keep his commandments. Let's talk about in verse 2 of chapter 5. At least we know that we love the children of God when we love God, when we obey his commandments. It means if I'm not obeying his commandments, if I do not love God, if I do not love the children of God, then I'm not walking in standing of God. And the idea of being someone who can never be taken away or fallen out of salvation if I live with that kind of lifestyle, I'm not abiding with the Father, which is a big part of what First John talks about, is how we abide with the Father. And we can have a confidence of how we abide with the Father, but living in sin is not one way that we do that. To quickly get through the last two points on this particular screen, talking about baptism and the Lord's Supper and identifying as a part of a local congregation. To summarize a little bit of what's up there, baptism is a prerequisite to the privileges of being in a church relation and being someone who's able to take the Lord's Supper. That baptism is not necessary for salvation. In fact, the next quote talks about that. Uh, they talk about how they speak against the dogma of baptismal regeneration. It's not essential for salvation, but it is essential to obey Jesus. It's part of where I start to get a little bit of confused. Uh, I don't have to do it to be saved, but I have to do it to obey how do we come to that conclusion? That's where we start to almost kind of talking past ourselves if we're not grounding ourselves with what we mean by what we say. Uh, as it goes on to say in that quote that obviously anybody who really loves Jesus and is a love of Christ would never refuse to be baptized, but do are we baptized in order to become a believer or are we baptized already as believers? That's where some of the differences are really going to clash. And going to places like Acts chapter 22 and verse 16 where it talks about baptism being when our sins are washed away. That is when our sins are forgiven. As well as related to the ordinances of baptism and the ordinances of the Lord's Supper, just this thought up here, that the time and place and frequency of this, there's no scriptural directions given on these things related to the Lord's Supper, that every local congregation kind of just decides, kind of as tradition in the Baptist churches, usually the first Sunday of the month seems to be the place that we do this. Obviously, 1 Corinthians 11, verse 28, talks about how it's not just for local members, but people examine themselves. That when I go travel somewhere, that if I'm there and I'm there to partake the Lord's Supper, that I look to myself and being worthy to do that. And just because I'm not a member there, I don't get to partake. As well as, obviously, Acts chapter 20 and verse 7, giving specifications for a first day of the week, uh, every first day of the week partaking of the Lord's Supper. Particularly that last slide up there, I know we moved fairly quickly. But I think those first three slides of teaching and doctrine are where we're really going to start to make sure we have a, a basis of what do you believe about how we become Christians and how we live as Christians. When it comes to moralities and things like that, there's probably a lot of some little similarities. But those are some points we want to be well acquainted with. We'll probably come back to in times ahead. I'm out of time as I, the, the tape is turned off and as I get a chance as kids are coming in. If I've spoken harshly, if I misrepresented, if I need to change my, my thoughts or I need to repent about something, I need to know about that. But I hope I was honest with that. I hope this helps us as we have conversations with our Baptist loved ones and being prepared to have some conversations that might lead to the teaching of truth. Thank you for your presence tonight.
Corey's not here, he said, you talk a lot in these Wednesday classes, and don't give us a chance to talk. I know I don't. But if there are further things to talk about, to say, please let me know after class, and we can keep those ready for next time. Thank you for being here this evening.